Good afternoon. You're very welcome to the Institute for International and European Affairs. A couple of housekeeping things. Um, I just, if not to embarrass anyone, if we put the telephones on silent, uh, please. And um, for today's meeting, um, the presentations will be on the record and the questions and answer session will be off the record. Um, we have a, a theme today, the future of sustainable biofuels in Europe, part of the solution, not part of the problem. Um, a, a topic uh, which attracts a, a certain amount of controversy and uh, at, at a, I suppose you might say at a worrying level, um, one which reason and, and science isn't always associated with the policy which seems to emerge. Um, it's a very timely topic. Um, one of our speakers tells me that there are decisions at committee level being made today in, in the European Parliament uh, which, are, which are relevant to the process of the uh, revision of the Energy Efficiency Directive which is, is uh, uh, going on and should be complete within a matter of uh, a few months. Um, we have two speakers who are going to address this topic. Um, Paul Dean is a research fellow uh, specializing in energy and climate policy with uh, the Marai Center. Um, help me, Paul, the uh, Marine and Renewable Energy. That's close enough, I think, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Institute, you think, yeah? Institute, yes. Institute yes. at yes. University College Cork. Um, and James Colgan, who's a industry and policy analysis at Ethanol Europe Renewables Limited. Um, um, Ethanol Europe is a, a very interesting firm. Um, they are, we're very grateful to them, sponsoring today, today's event. They happen to be the, to um, run the largest um, bioethanol, bioethanol refinery in Europe, I understand, um, in Europe, uh, in, in Hungary, it's in, in Hungary. So uh, might I ask, uh, Paul, to uh, uh, lead off, please. Great. Good afternoon, every, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes. Um, transport is really one of the big climate and energy challenges uh, facing Europe. The graph here shows, um, keep an eye on the red line, what's worrying about transport is not only does it represent about 20% of our emissions in Europe, but it's also trending up. Uh, this is bulk transport emissions here. Within that, the only sector that's actually reducing emissions in Europe in transport is actually rail, and that's just because of some electrification and taking some older um, um, uh, stock out of, uh, out of commissioning. So emissions are increasing, and we really need to do something serious about it. Um, to combat this, the, the, the European Commission set uh, renewable transport targets for each member state if we look at the graph here on the right, first of all, what this graph shows is this is the distance to target for each member state to that 10% target. Member states in red are doing really badly. Member states in green have achieved their target and doing very well. What's interesting about this graph actually is, first thing, the majority of renewable transport in Europe, over 95%, is met by liquid biofuels. Um, often when we think about renewable transport, we think of the Teslas, the Elon Musk, the renewables, the, the EVs, in, today, in today's uh, Europe, renewable, um, well, particularly electric vehicles, make a negligible contribution to the overall renewable transport target. The countries that are doing well, Sweden and Finland and Scandinavia, of course, are primarily achieving their targets through the use of biodiesel and, and blended bioethanol. Um, Ireland actually isn't doing too bad in terms of our target for renewable transport. That's bad, of course, relative to our terrible for the, uh, uh, the other targets that we have for emissions and overall renewable energy. Uh, we hear a lot about Norway in terms of electric vehicles. The graph on the left-hand side, side shows the exact number of pure electric vehicles sold in Europe last year. Last year in Ireland, we had just under 400 pure uh, EVs sold uh, in the country. That figure really needs to ratchet up incredibly if we're taking the decarbonisation tran uh, of transport seriously. Norway, which is not shown on the graph outside the EU28, is doing fantastically well in terms of renewable transport. They will probably reach their 10% target this year. The bulk of that target actually is achieved through um, uh, blending bioliquids, um, uh, uh, but also with a significant portion actually with EVs. 
Uh, what Norway have shown us is that if you want to have widespread deployment of electric vehicles, you need to give generous subsidies. The average subsidy for an electric vehicle in Norway is about 9,300 euro. That's not, that's not including the softer exchequer costs around free tolls and bridges, free parking and stuff like this. Um, so in terms of the overall landscape, we see that renewable fuels, renewable liquid fuels are really doing a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of decarbonizing Europe's uh, transport fleet. Electric vehicles will, of course, play a very important and fundamental part of decarbonizing transport today and into the future. Our analysis in UCC and similar to European Commission analysis would show that by 2030, about 3 to 4 percent of energy and transport will be met by electricity in 2030. That's under pretty optimistic um, scenarios. The difficulty, of course, for electric vehicles, while the technology is there, is cost. And as well, it's competing against the cost of internal combustion engines that are growing in efficiency, efficiency through, mecha uh, through, through mechanical and thermal efficiency, but also the blending of biofuels actually improves their environmental performance. So electric vehicles really have to run fast to stand still in terms of their environmental, uh, in terms of their cost performance. But their day will come and will play a, a, an important role in decarbonizing the, uh, the wider fleet. So we, we're, we are going to need um, uh, liquid biofuels. Liquid biofuels over the last number of years have got a, a very bad reputation, particularly in the, in the wider and in the mass media. Part of the difficulty here, well, there's a number of difficulties here. First of all, many of you might be familiar with the food versus fuel debate. Uh, this is, I suppose, a very simplistic argument, which means that if you're growing biofuels in the EU, you're causing uh, food shortages somewhere else in the world. The European uh, Union or the European Commission progress report on renewable energy states this year that that is not happening. European bioenergy and bio, uh, bioenergy policy and transport has no impact on food shortages in the world. Um, part of this argument is, 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 I suppose it's a conceptual argument, but part of the, um, um, part of the difficulty, or really if we want to have a conversation about food and fuel, it really has to start with acknowledging the fact that we live in a world of excess. We are producing more food uh, with less land in Europe at the moment. Um, the unfortunate hardship facing about 20 million people who are facing starvation in the planet today, which has come significantly down uh, in the last 20 years, those hardships are primarily around access to food rather than food shortage. So food supply is uneven and not well distributed. Um, and as well, we live in a world of where we waste incredible amounts of food. Uh, I read a fact recently that globally, at a global level, the amount of food we waste is, is equivalent to the land production area of China in terms of what we, uh, in terms of what we waste. Um, the other difficulty that's, that's uh, um, facing biofuels in the wider media is that we generally talk about bioenergy or bioliquids as one particular type. Um, that's not true. Bioenergy is a very wide and varied heterogeneous stock of different feedstocks from different locations with different technology pathways to, uh, um, uh, to different fuel mixes. If you look at the photograph over in your left there, what you see, you see that gentleman working on top. He's working on top of palm bunches there. Um, some biofuels are good, some biofuels are very good, and some are terrible. And I think you'd really have to put palm oil, um, palm oil diesel into the terrible bracket. Um, the scientific evidence shows that there is, the scientific evidence to show that the environmental benefits from uh, biodiesel producing palm oil is very, very low. And really, if we're serious about the environmental integrity, I think, of, uh, of bioliquids and biofuels, we should think seriously about uh, banning or certainly reducing the role of palm oil in, that, uh, in, our, in, our, in our fuel mix. If we're going to talk about land-based biofuels, let's talk about how we use land in Europe. Uh, what we see here, on starting from the very left, working to the right, this is the total EU land area, uh, excluding water bodies, cities. Uh, um, if the next graph over shows the utilised agricultural area, this is the productive land that we have in Europe, which is about a little less than 40% of the total land area. Thankfully, it excludes forests. Thankfully, for afforestation is increasing in, uh, in Europe. We have more forest. Interestingly, about this uh, utilised agricultural area, this area is actually diminishing each year in Europe. We're losing about 1,000 square kilometres a year to urban sprawl, to uh, road infrastructure, to um, uh, roads, airports. Um, that number is also increasing, decreasing due to land abandonment issues. People are leaving the land, particularly in places of uh, southwest Europe and southern Europe. Um, the area of arable land is shown there, the area used for land for cereals, uh, wheat, corn, uh, uh, barley, etc. 
uh, is about 7% of the total um, utilised agricultural area. And the majority of that land, actually, about 66% of the land for cereals is used for growing cereals for, for animals, for, uh, for, for animal feed. Um, humans consume about 30%, and about 1% to 2% is actually used for ethanol in Europe. One of the issues around the recent Commission decision to uh, try and limit the use of land-based or food-based uh, biolicas in, ba in Europe is based around the issue of indirect land use change. This is a tricky concept, uh, and the science is contested, uh, probably because it's actually complicated and, 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 and challenging enough to model. But essentially, before I explain this graph, what indirect land use change is, if you have a, an acre of land and you're growing onions, carrots, or whatever spuds, you... Um, change that land use for growing, you want to grow uh, um, um, uh, rapeseed oil for, for biodiesel, the demand for those onions will still exist, and those onions will have to be planted somewhere else, and either they're planted in land that has to be changed to form, uh, from one type of production to another agricultural production, uh, and the emissions from those indirect consequences must be taken into account. Uh, the issue also happens if you're creating a demand for a market outside of Europe, such as in the, the case of palm oil, where land is being cleared, um, uh, deforested, and swamps and peatlands have been drained for the production of palm oil uh, diesel. The emissions associated from the clearing of the land, from the, from the preparation of the ground, can be, on some circumstances, far greater than the emissions reduction benefit from the actual fuel itself. And what this graph tries to do is... It tries to, this is a review of all the recent literature. It's a report produced by the European Commission. It looks at all the available literature in indirect land use change. And what I'd like you to look at here is the grey columns and look at the whiskers. And what the science tells us is that if you look at the, the grey columns from ethanol, they're much lower than the grey columns from the biodiesel, uh, meaning that the uh, land use change risk from ethanol is much lower than, um, than from biodiesel. Some of the, let me see, is there a pointer on this here? Some of these, um, no, there isn't. If you look at PAM, uh, PAM biodiesel, that actually goes off. The, the whisker is actually displayed, the risks around the high values and the low values. Uh, what's very clear, again, from the scientific evidence is that the risks of uh, indirect land use change from biodiesel is much, much higher than it is from, uh, from ethanol. Now, these series here are a series of average graphs. What they hide is a lot of nuance and a lot of local conditions. If you're growing a crop on land that has been set aside or that is not competing with land use, then of course you have a zero uh, indirect or a very low indirect land use change. But essentially what we want to do from a policy perspective and from an environmental perspective is that we want to encourage fuels that have low risk in terms of land use change and we want to discourage fuels that have a high risk. Uh, what's interesting actually in this graph is that, and what's kind of awkward from a European Commission level, is that if you look at the advanced uh, and the ethanol uh, section, advanced biofuels are, I suppose, put forward as the next generation in terms of biofuels. What the a review of the scientific literature said is that those advanced biofuels are not actually immune from indirect land use change uh, risk either. Um, so really what we need to do is we need to tailor and design policies that rewards biofuels that limits the, the risk of indirect land use change and uh, we need to really reduce the ones that, that uh, in terms of, um, specifically the terms of, in terms of biodiesels um, that have high risk associated with them. Let's look a bit closer to home, how we use biofuels in Ireland. As I said, Ireland's actually doing reasonably well, and we're about mid-table in terms of our uh, renewable transport. Uh, I think we're about 6 or 7% um, uh, renewable transport at the moment. We have a blending, a biofuels blending obligation in Ireland, where 85 8.6% uh, by volume um, of mineral oil blended must be blended with, uh, with bioliquids. Uh, the majority of our uh, bioliquids in Ireland come from biodiesel. 75% um, of that is actually used cooking oil, and about 22% of that is tallow uh, to buy a product from, the, uh, from, the, the, from slaughterhouses. We source most of that, most of that feedstock is actually sourced from the, the two great democracies of the UK and the US, uh, and we have some small imports of, with small um, um, uh, tallow activity here in the refinery in Cork as well. Uh, a much lower percentage of our blended fuel, about 37%, comes from ethanol, and the majority of that is, is wheat-based, corn-based, or sugar-based. Ireland, most of our, in fact, all of our, um, uh, sorry, most of our bioliquids in Ireland come from within the EU, except for, of course, some of the stuff that the, the used cooking oil that comes from outside of the States. Um, 
one thing to note though, when you're looking at this graph, uh, certain, certain bioliquids such as used cooking oil, which are waste-based, or tallow, which is waste-based, qualify for a double accreditation or even higher when it comes to credits. So they actually, that allows Ireland to actually hit a higher paper on target than we're doing in reality. Uh, but still, I think we're doing reasonably well, but we need to do a lot more, I think, in, uh, in progressing renewable transport uh, in Ireland. <clears throat> the, um, again, in Ireland, we hear a lot about emissions reduction and electric vehicles. Electric vehicles do provide uh, emissions reductions in Ireland, um, but small in comparison to the, uh, the actual emissions reductions due to the biofuel obligation, which is about, uh, about 350 kilotons of CO2. Of course, the figure for EVs will rise. One of the advantages from a policy perspective, and if you want, we can go into this in the Q&A, but when you electrify transport, you essentially move the emissions from the, um, what we call the non-traded emissions sector into the traded emissions sectors. And essentially, they become the responsibility or the problem of the folks who produce electricity rather than the burden of the Irish state. That's one of the advantages from a policy perspective of EVs over biodiesels. Um, but really, in the challenge, and, and I think um, um, the news yesterday in terms of how Ireland is doing in terms of emissions, trans emissions and transport are increasing, and we need to look at ways of doing, um, of doing things a little bit more uh, clean. There are some technical challenges and some economic challenges that are specific to Ireland that are not necessarily specific to other member states. So there's a couple of things that we need to think about a little bit more in terms of uh, renewable biofuels in Ireland. Number one, starting, that's my local uh, Maxall there down in Clannacilty. You will notice while it's very clean, it has only two pumps. Uh, if you go to Europe, you'll see that a lot of um, cities will have three pumps. So if we want to blend higher levels of ethanol in Europe, we need to, um, those petrol grades need to be kept separately. So we will probably have to consider um, having, um, uh, looking at the costs or some way of incentivizing folks who own the four courts to put in extra pumps. Uh, our, our extra tanks. Also, a lot of the ethanol that we bring into Ireland comes into ports like uh, Foynes, uh, Dublin, uh, Whitegate. You, we would probably need to build extra infrastructure as well to store that grade of petrol. It needs to be kept separately from, the, um, uh, from different blends. So there are two costs and some practical issues. In terms of the UK, that's not actually in terms of Brexit. The type of unleaded petrol that we blend with ethanol is a specific type of petrol that primarily comes from the UK. If the UK deviate away from their uh, current uh, biofuels policy, that will make the market available for that unleaded petrol a little bit more niche and potentially harder to get. So that's one of the other things that we need to think about. And finally, in terms of weather, this primarily affects biodiesel, not, in this, uh, not at all uh, ethanol. Um, it's very difficult to blend levels of biodiesel when the weather is cold. Uh, it can sit in your tank and they can be uh, um, uh, flow conditions. So in generally what we do in Ireland for biodiesel that we blend into our pumps, and generally when any of us buy uh, biodiesel, when we buy diesel or petrol in Ireland, most of us, if you drive a diesel car, you're probably driving about 500 kilometers on, uh, on biodiesel on average in the year. Uh, but that, that blending is avoided in the winter months because of um, uh, cold conditions, which can limit uh, the, the, the viscosity of that uh, blend. There are ways around that. The refinery in Cork is looking at it, exciting new techniques around hydro-treating vegetable oil, which is behind the blend. That will allow you, of course, to have much higher blends. Um, and of course, there is a cost associated um, um, with each one of these things. So these are cost challenges, some technical challenges, but stuff in Ireland that we generally need to think about a little bit more. So in conclusion, I think the future, if we're serious about decarbonising transport in Europe and in Ireland, we need to seriously consider the role of, uh, of all biofuels uh, in transport. We probably need to have more mature and more sensible conversations about land-based uh, biofuels. They should be evidence-based and they should be science-driven. Uh, and really what we need is looking at, because the, the family of biofuels is so heterogeneous, we really need policy at European and maybe Irish level that's nuanced enough, nuanced enough to encourage the correct types of bio biofuels uh, that deliver meaningful emissions reduction. And finally, in Ireland, we do need to think a, bit, a little more, more about some of those practical challenges that we're facing. We need to evaluate the costs and really, I suppose, decide on where we want to take transport in the future. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Dr. Dean, um, James. James, I didn't say, is an electrical engineer, is it? Electronic Electronics, engineering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, both houses. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just go forward, yeah. Great. Okay, thank you very much. All right, well, thank you very, very much, everybody, and thank you, Brendan, for being interested in the first place and, uh, and actually opening up this dialogue. Um, 
Okay, so that didn't come out so well. I Yeah, I do. Yeah. Is, do you think there's anything we can do on that? No? Um, in the meantime, anyway, I'll tell you a little bit about Ethanol Europe Renewables Limited. Um, it is a very much a new entrant into the uh, bioenergy world in Europe, founded just eight years ago and um, operating just since two thousand uh, 2012. It's a family and management owned firm. It's Irish, founded by uh, the Turley brothers who are here in the room. And um, it was a complete surprise in the industry in Europe insofar as at the time, it was, uh, the project was developed based on the 2009 Renewable Energy Directive. That Renewable Energy Directive uh, uh, created demand for enormous amount of biofuels that weren't uh, already required. And that meant that hundreds of new biofuels operations were going to be needed in Europe. Yeah. Uh, OK, some of them, the less busy slides aren't. Uh, OK, that looks badly affected, but the rest seem OK. Um, OK, so the plant opened. Uh, it's a corn-based ethanol plant, ethanol refinery, located in Hungary simply because Hungary is the corn basket of Europe. Uh, Hungary produces a lot of corn and has the capacity to produce a lot more. Um, the, uh, the plant was a surprise insofar as nobody was expecting somebody to come on the scene and actually go ahead with such a large ambitious project. And there were a lot of other projects on the table at the time and none of them have gone ahead. So this was the, actually the only one. And even more of a surprise to everybody in the industry that these Irish people who had never produced bioenergy before um, actually were very successful at it. And it's now the single biggest uh, ethanol biorefinery in Europe. Um, it's the most uh, resource efficient and also economically efficient refinery in Europe. Um, we buy over a million tons of grain for year, uh, per year from the local farmers. We make 500 million liters uh, of ILAC free ethanol. 500 million liters is the equivalent of one two hundredth of world capacity uh, of ethanol. Um, I say ILAC free ethanol. ILAC free, ILAC is the indirect land use change acronym. It's the acronym that's used to signal that there's a risk that when you produce something using a crop, uh, an agricultural crop, that maybe you're displacing other markets for that crop, and that could either drive up prices or deprive more needy markets for it, or both. Uh, I say it's ILAC free because if you go and look at the, um, the agricultural uh, community that we buy the grain from, all of that grain is additional to what would they were producing before we built the plant. Uh, so, and none of it would have been produced if we hadn't built the plant. So none of it's being diverted from anybody, any other market. It hasn't come from extra land either, so it's not as if the land has been diverted because, in fact, the amount of land being used for corn production in Hungary over the last five years has decreased. Uh, so it's a positive, it's a certainly an ILAC free story, and the other positive impact is that there are several hundred farm families who now have secure long-term demand for their grain, and they know that every year if they produce it, they've got somebody who's going to buy it, and that means they can buy new tractors, that their kids can study agriculture, that they're, the ones who've gone away and learned English and are working in London can come back and get a job. And that's actually what's happening, and it's a very tangible, measurable thing. I'm from Cork, and Cork is a, an, a foreign direct investment city. Uh, my father works in Pfizer, so I, I'm a foreign direct investment child. And I know very well what it's like to live in a place where the whole economy is lifted by FDI. Well, if you go to the place where this plant is in the last five years, you can see the lift in a very, very tangible way. Um, it, we produce 350,000 tons of GMO-free protein feed, which uh, is an excellent substitute for imported soy protein from the Americas, and 15,000 tons of corn oil. Um, it puts about half a billion euros into the local economy every year. In addition, it's not just producing uh, feed and ethanol, it's a, it's a hub of um, development activity for new bioeconomy uh, projects and that their energy, their feed, but they're also uh, materials and some very quirky stuff, which I'll mention a bit later. Uh, this year we got 135 million of fresh finance. Part of that was substituting American finance, what was in the business, and part of it is new for um, uh, new project development innovation. Even though it's located in Hungary, the scientists, engineers, managers, finance is all coming out of here, and that's 
that's continuing. So there are new Irish scientists, engineers, and managers involved. You know, well, we've just opened a new office here in Dublin with seats for another 30 people. Uh, so that gives you an indication of the direction of things. Uh, why are we here today? Well, we are very proud, actually, to be active in policy discourse in, in Ireland, in Europe, in the world. Uh, and that, that was another surprise, I think, to the guys who set it up. They didn't expect to be here today or doing what we're doing now in terms of getting involved in, in, in engaging in public discourse. Uh, I just came back from two weeks in Bonn as a partner to the EU, United Nations Climate um, Committee. Uh, we were selected as a partner after they reviewed ethanol in as an instrument uh, in addressing climate change. Um, and we spent two weeks there uh, as an, an awareness exercise to enable all of the delegations from the 160 countries that were there to kind of come and explore it if they wanted to. Um, I was, uh, we were also in Rome in October at the United Nations Committee on Food Security because the food, the FAO, um, after a little bit of doubt 10 years ago, is firmly the view that biofuels and food are interlinked and that there can be a very positive interlinkage rather than a negative interlinkage. So we are a partner on the Committee on Food Security. We're very active in EPR, the Association for Renewable Ethanol, very active in Farm Europe, which is a, an upstart, a new entrant into farm policy thinking in Europe, but it's a very um, ambitious, active, uh, smart, and agile organization. It's located right across from the Berlin and Brussels, uh, uh, building in Brussels. And their ambition is really to be there shaping new, the cap reform for after 2020. And, but, you know, and they're, they're already making a big uh, impact there. We're involved in the European Commission's bio-based industry uh, joint undertaking, uh, and then a few of their um, energy platforms. Um, we've definitely been involving with the Irish government, and thank you very much to anybody in the government here who's met us, and we've met quite a number of people. It's been terrific. We're submitting to the Irish government consultations, and we're here today, and I know I've met some of you before, and I'm sure some of you probably heard from me before through the email and so on, and it, it, it's actually been, uh, a, good, a great experience in Ireland recently. Uh, so this all, we got to tie it back to what the burning platform is and why we're all here in the first place, which is climate change and the huge engineering and industrial solutions that are urgently needed to deal with it. And so, you know, my two weeks in Bonn with the, um, with the COP23 uh, is all founded on the notion that we got to do something very big very soon. Uh, as uh, Paul uh, outlined to you, transport is definitely the worst offender. So I was, uh, the difficulty when speaking with transport is um, speaking with, on the one hand, a mindset which imagines electric vehicles on the road virtually instantly, and then the mindset that recognizes that we've got two, uh, you know, uh, 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 more than a billion vehicles on the planet, and uh, most of them are, are, all of them actually, effectively, are burning fossil fuels. Um, and uh, that fleet is growing quite quickly. Uh, all of the growth is in fossil fuel burning vehicles right now. Uh, and so how do we manage the fact that the, the notion that we have two mindsets? We've got the mindset. In, in, I, I heard the ex-head of the UNFCCC uh, declare in Bonn that the transport carbon challenge was solved, that we had electric vehicles. And that our only problem now, and she, there was Americans in the room, there was the, there was the big American contingent there, our only problem now was what to do with the 400,000 American truck drivers who were out of work. So that's just to illustrate to you a kind of a, a complete disconnect between some of the thinking that's going on and the reality on the road. I live in Italy, there isn't a single electrical vehicle, nobody ever talks about it, nobody has one. I live in an affluent area room, there's 20,000 people there, we have 20,000 cars, and there isn't a single electrical vehicle where I live. Same in Poland and pretty much the same in Ireland. Uh, so we have policy thinking being dictated by people who live in the Nordic, Nordic countries and who do actually cycle and who do actually buy stuff in supermarkets in the organic section. And yet, in the real world, we've got to, we've got to deal with a problem that's much more intractable than that. So I did some calculations just to say that peak oil on the road is nowhere here, here yet, even with the most optimistic scenarios for electric vehicle introduction, of which I'm a fan. I don't have a car myself anymore. Uh, I do have an electric bike. Um, peak oil on the road, nowhere near is it going to come anywhere near before 2035 um, on any of the uh, even uh, optimistic scenarios right now. And it could be way beyond that. By the time we get to 2050, we may have got carbon emissions on the road back down to today's levels, by which time the fleet will have doubled, 
and we'll have half electric mo mobility and half fossil fuel. That's worldwide. Hopefully Ireland will be in a much more positive place compared to the average. Uh, but, but it's not an, a, 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 an absurd scenario for Ireland either in terms of fleet growth generally and the mix of energy in the fleet. Um, so what, uh, just coming back then to ethanol specifically as a solution, what is it? It's a climate-friendly petrol sub substitute for today's fleets, for, this, for the kind of technology we've got on the road right now. It's produced by high-tech fermentation of grain or beet to beer, and then that beer is distilled to alcohol. So it's a very old business. It's just on an extraordinarily high-tech way. So we're getting enormously high amounts of alcohol at per ton of grain compared to people producing beer or vodka or compared to how people were, uh, compared to the yields we were getting even five or 10 years ago. So I mean, one of the quotes that we have is that if we were producing today at the same yields that we were producing five years ago, we'd be out of business. That's how quick things are changing. People say, what is the biggest development in the ethanol sector right now? The biggest development is that continuous improvement rather than some amazingly disruptive thing that's going to change or anything. 5% uh, of most petrol today in, the Europe, in Europe is uh, ethanol, uh, up to 100% in some vehicles. We've got, uh, Laura, if, uh, it's up to 9% in Ireland by volume. It's still 5%. It's it's still five, but, and the yeah, obligation? Actual, real, yeah, okay. Um, certified 66% less greenhouse gas than oil. So that's certified, and so there's a very rigorous annual certification process that goes on over the all of Europe, over all the plants. And every single tanker load that leaves our factory go goes out with its own certification in terms of its uh, carbon emissions and its life cycle analysis uh, profile. As Paul was saying, only 2% of the EU, EU grain crop uh, goes into it, and, and, uh, and then that's only the low-value starch and sugar in the grain crop. So the protein, the fiber, the vegetable oil go back to the farm for GMO-free GMO feed. Uh, and at the same time, we've co-production of exciting new biorefinery bio products coming out of it as well. Um, output could easily be upped uh, to let the petrol sector exceed the 2030 goals in Europe. So just on the petrol, if, if we look at ethanol as a solution for the petrol sector, it is feasible that ethanol could be the primary solution instrument in this time frame for reaching um, 2030 climate goals. We're not in the business of competing with other solutions. It's great to have a mix of solutions. What we're looking for is a policy framework that allows people to choose to use ethanol if that's what they want to do, rather than deciding that you can't choose things for one reason or another. Um, so again, as, as Paul referred to, not all biofuels are made equal. So I've, broadly speaking, we've got the good, the bad, and the very, we've got the good, the okay, and the bad. Uh, definitely a European crop-based ethanol is safe and effective. It's a peace of mind solution for policymakers. No policymaker will ever wake up and find that ethanol has bit them in the butt in some way. It's, they're, they're all of the envelopes of usage scenarios are pretty well are, are safe. So we could make and use lots more of it and still be safe. European biodiesel, so it's produced from European crops, is also a very safe solution. All of the current supplies of European biodiesel are safe and effective. They don't bring about adverse side effects. However, if, we're, if one were to go and produce lots more of it in Europe, one would have to do it with governance to assure that it was done on marginal land, done in crop rotation, done from certain types of crops. But there is definitely scope for producing more. If anybody in the room is familiar with the term ILAC, as we referred to it earlier, and land use change issues, which is the basis of the Commission's current negative uh, attitude to biofuels in general. Palm oil is the street word for ILAC. Uh, forests and peatlands are being destroyed in order to make European palm diesel possible. Europe accounts for 5% of palm oil output in the world, and it accounts for European biodiesel, and it accounts for 15% of palm oil growth and demand worldwide. So it's a significant driver in the whole PAM, um, uh, the PAM debate. If we get rid of PAM oil diesel, we'd pretty well make biofuels in Europe a safe and effective thing generally. We'd pretty well have solved the problem. Um, ethanol is essential to Ireland, not just for the climate. Uh, and it's essential to Europe, not just for the climate. Um, European biofuels bring in 7 billion euros of farm incomes. That's the equivalent to over 10% of CAP, so it's actually a huge amount of, uh, of income for farmers, or 
2,000 euros for every single tillage farmer in Europe if you were to average it out. Uh, it also brings 15 million tons of GMO and antibiotic-free uh, feed. Uh, that's a high-quality feed. Now, there, uh, we recently reached out to a half a dozen of Europe's um, animal nutrition researchers and asked them what they thought about it. And I have to say, the reactions were mixed. But then I've discovered why the reactions were mixed. Because 10 years ago, if you were producing ethanol and you produced feed as a byproduct, you really didn't care whether that feed was good or bad. And you didn't care whether it changed from one month to the next. But that's completely changed in the last 10 years. Now, that feed is seen as a high value part of the output of that plant, and the plant couldn't exist without it. So an awful lot of emphasis is put on making sure that that feed is extremely high quality and, and that that quality is maintained from month to month. That means the color of it, the nutritional characteristics, the smell of it, the humidity of it, and then how it's handled and shipped. Uh, so we've got uh, uh, a brand called Pannonia Gold, and that Pannonia Gold has essentially created a whole uh, family of brands of very high quality Euro European um, uh, animal, protein animal feeds. Uh, reducing uh, our imports of GMO so soy from the Americas. Uh, in addition, then, we've got about oh, 220,000 off-farm jobs in rural areas. I mean, in, in our plant alone, we've brought over 2,000 jobs into the area. Um, and investment in innovation in the bioeconomy. And as I referred, we've got a, a new office here for 20 or 30 people in Dublin. That's all about those um, investment and innovation in the bioeconomy. It's the new companies that uh, have been opened up in our group in the recent months. It's the science that we're funding. It's the product launches that are uh, taking place very soon. Um, we've got an interesting... Um, uh, set of dynamics going on in Brussels which impact agricultural life in Europe. Um, it's not an easy place, uh, Europe, to be a farmer, and it's not somewhere where your, f your kids might want to uh, take up the, the role after you. Uh, we've got um, uh, cheap imports from outside Europe. We've got the trade talks where farmers are being used as trinkets to, in trade deals where you know, we sell more BMWs to Argentina and we'll take more of their beef. Um, we've got uh, Brexit, which is going to completely uh, destabilize Irish uh, agriculture. Um, Ireland has tended in Europe, that I understand, to be an ally of the UK in European policy debate that in fact, uh, impacts farming. That ally is gone. And Ireland now has to very much uh, plough its own furrow and uh, uh, be much more uh, in control of its own destiny and be, uh, take a more leadership role, which, by the way, it's already doing. There's, no, uh, uh, there's not a criticism. Uh, but what you see are islands, alliances uh, taking, uh, uh, emerging uh, in Europe among the farm-friendly countries. And this is something that Ireland will be getting more involved in in terms of determining who are its new allies in, in things. One, uh, a very clear example of this is um, President Macron in France has been fighting very much for his farmers' beef and his farmers' ethanol. Now, he doesn't really care that much about the ethanol. He cares about the fact that ethanol is, is a synonym of farm demand. It's a masked way of, uh, a masked form of protectionism. So if you're a farmer, you should really want ethanol to be uh, protected because it protects farm demand. It's not about, uh, for Macron, it's not strictly speaking about the fuel itself. In our opinion, Ireland would do very well to be an ally of President Macron in his beef and ethanol uh, um, position as regards Mercosur, as opposed to just being on the beef side of things. Uh, in part, the basis of that is, is that um, if uh, we are supporting Macron today on beef and ethanol, he'll be supporting us tomorrow on something else. And that would be the same with the Central and Eastern European countries, the Visegrad group, who are very much farm uh, orientated in how their economies work. And they've, they've actually found their, let's say, their fighting spirit in terms of protecting their farm sectors. Um, uh, so we would hope, we see already, we would hope to see more of Ireland uh, understanding the new landscape in Brussels in terms of who the farm allies are and to uh, engage in strong European farm-friendly alliances. In terms of the uh, transport biofuels uh, specifically um, um, and how we would actually use the ethanol, um, we need to put up 
you know, who's doing it already, who does uh, seem to be able to make progress, who's making climate progress, who's, making, who's using a lot of biofuels, and Sweden is in the top three. Uh, Sweden has 24% of renewables and transport already overall, and that's growing reasonably quickly, so they're way ahead of their target. And 17% of the 24 is actually biofuels. Uh, Sweden has a 30-70 mix between petrol and ethanol across the entire fleet, so that's including buses, trucks and buses, which is similar to Ireland. Their ethanol is mostly in the form of 5%, E5, which as Laura said is the same as what we've got here, but they've also got the very high blends of E85 and ED95, which go into either captive fleets or um, um, haulage and public transport. They've got a reasonable balance of domestic and imports, so it's not like they have some kind of magic well of biofuels that they, that they have and that we don't have. Um, and uh, they're certainly benefiting from the cleaner air dimension of that because ethanol, once you put it into, uh, into your petrol from 10% blends and up, you get significant reductions in the uh, pollutants, the tailpipe pollutants, as well as um, uh, greater engine efficiency. Today is a very uh, important day in the legislative cycle for renewable energy in that the lead committee in the European Parliament called the ITRA committee is voting on it. Uh, they voted this morning. Uh, a couple of weeks ago it was very important because the European Council published its fourth version of the legislation. Uh, the Council's version, and there's Minister Knox in there, who I met in Bonn uh, ten days ago. Um, the Council's version uh, was very positive from our perspective, but I think from everybody's perspective insofar as it certainly pointed the way towards a high level of ambition for new renewables generally, so above the 27% that the European Commission proposed. It, it's behind a, having a target for tr the transport sector specifically of 12%, so 12% is much lower than the average in recognition of the fact that transport is a very hard sector to decarbonize, but it's still giving it a, 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 a target nonetheless. Um, confirming the 7% cap on crop-based biofuel, which is to limit things like palm diesel, but not reducing that cap as the Commission had proposed, and then also putting in a clause which would allow uh, safe, effective biofuels like our ethanol to be supported above the cap so that there wouldn't be a label put on a biofuel, so it's crop-based, bad, that label has been taken away. The, the idea that you can simply, in a very simplistic way, decide what's good or bad just by one single label uh, has been taken away, which is a very uh, positive thing. So definitely ambition married to common sense. What the U European Parliament uh, vo committee voted on today was 35% uh, renewable energy overall, so definitely at the very high level of ambition on the scale. 12% in, in transport, which is good, but much more uh, complex on the 7% and the, how that 12% of transport would be achieved. A lot of what the committee voted on today in terms of how the 12% would be achieved is based around um, uh, advanced biofuels, advanced solutions. And the, one of the characteristics of advanced is that it doesn't actually, it's not actually a, uh, an incumbent technology. It's not a tried and tested technology. So what they're looking at is putting in place a requirement to use solutions which aren't actually tried and tested and aren't actually economical. Now, we're not in the business of competing with them, but we are in the business of telling people whether or not we think the policy is rational or not. And the idea that one would put an obligation on countries to do something that has, nobody has yet done in the world, and, and even the most optimistic projections are that if you do try and do it, it'll cost you an absolute fortune. I don't think that's a very sane way of devising a renewables policy. Um, Ireland's climate ambition in, 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 in all of this right now, well, just on the 17th of November, the European Council published um, the Ireland's comments on the re most recent renewable energy directive draft. And um, in summary, Ireland is saying we shouldn't have a target for renewable in transport simply because it's very hard to, re to reach. And that's true, it is very hard to reach, especially if we feel that there's no appetite for actually doing anything to try and reach it. So, you know, you can, where there's a will, there's a way. If there's no will, then of course, it's gonna be very hard to reach. We may not reach it. Uh, so that's kind of an, a, a difficult quandary to have to resolve. But if the overall target's gonna be 35%, and it's looking like it is going to be in that for all of Europe in terms of renewables in energy, then it's not unreasonable to expect that transport generally is going to have to reach 12% or more. If 
the transport is reaching 12% or more, it means all the countries are in the same problem, having the same problem together. It's true that Finland and Sweden are way ahead of the pack, but Ireland is actually in a very long tail of people who are all behaving very badly. So it's not as if we're somehow the, the, the class dunce and we're the only ones who aren't going to be able to solve it. We should be able to come up with solutions with them, which will be a mix of more electric vehicles and a mix of more biofuels. Um, what I, you know, my observation about it is that it, the Irish position right now amounts to very limited climate ambition and very low support for uh, farm and food and bioeconomy. So last slide. Uh, so what should we do? Well, uh, uh, no time to do there. Uh, Ireland should say yes to climate progress. So get its mojo back, get, be, be, be more optimistic, be more uh, forthright in, in uh, uh, coming up with solutions and driving them through. Um, say yes to farm incomes, food quality, the bioeconomy. And uh, just to leave you with an image of what I think, you know, what 2030 is going to look like in terms of the mix of, of transport energy on the road, it's going to look pretty much what it looks like today. Uh, the car there is a Mini. It's, you can buy it. It's a double hybrid. It's a hybrid, hybrid plug-in electrical vehicle. But I call it a double hybrid, hybrid because it's got a combustion engine in there that can run on ethanol on petrol, so it's very flexible. And it's got an electrical engine in there that can run on wind and coal, so equally flexible. So you're not forcing the vehicle to match your energy supply. You're, you're, you've got a system that's very accommodating both on electricity and on um, uh, um, internal combustion. Thank you very much.